Now we're going to bring in another voice now. That would be Olivier Rafowitz, a colonel with the IDF and one of our senior military consultants. Olivier, it's good to have you on the line again. Since we're just focusing on the northern border, we did see Blinken there thanking the Lebanese government for not getting involved. But the big question is, when it comes down to the government there versus Hezbollah, they don't have as much influence as the terror groups have. So what actual say do they have in preventing Lebanon from entering an all-out war here? Good afternoon, and thank you uh, having me on the on board. Hezbollah is very strong. It's a very strong, very uh, major terrorist organization, uh, even uh, stronger than the Lebanese government, depending on Iran. And uh, what we are facing now, it's an escalation of violence along the border without really seeing a further escalation that we have every day uh, shooting and uh, bombing and uh, attempts of infiltration. So what we can understand that the government of, of Lebanon, of Beirut, maybe prefers not to have any uh, problem in the south, but we see that he is not capable to stop Hezbollah uh, terrorist organization do so. So we have seen an increase in the intensity, if not the actual frequency, of attacks coming from over the border. And everyone's still wondering whether or not Hezbollah will be committing to this fight. On Friday, Hassan Nasrallah gave his, his much expected speech, but he didn't really say much of anything to commit in either direction. Is there any sort of idea from inside the military of what his actual thoughts might be? Of course, I'm not going to comment in any way the speech of uh, Nasrallah, the uh, chief of the uh, terrorist organization. But what we are facing every day, gunning and uh, bombing and attacks, attempts, uh, and we have to react, show that uh, we cannot uh, rely on any speech, on any uh, allocution. We have to deal with concrete uh, ev events like uh, bombing and attacks. So here we are facing them like today, and we are trying to prevent escalation, and the Israeli army, I would say, is uh, ready to do whatever it will be asked to do in case of uh, development along this very sensitive border. Olivier, I want to now look at the southern border, at the fighting going on in Gaza. It's been a week since ground operations began in earnest. I want to discuss what's been accomplished in that time, what's left to accomplish, and really what the time in between those is going to look like. The ground operation uh, started, like I said, a week ago with very uh, important forces. Right now, the Israeli army, Sahal, is uh, um, around the uh, uh, Gaza City area, in the northern part of Gaza City. We have achieved uh, very, uh, very important achievements. Uh, around 300,000 targets of uh, Hamas have been hit by the Israeli army. We have killed quite high number of uh, operatives and high number of uh, senior uh, terrorists from uh, Hamas military branch. And right now we are continuing the operation. I would like to say and to emphasize that the Israeli army has no intention and no uh, mission to uh, hit or to involve civilian during the operations against Hamas. But from the other side, that's a big problem here. Hamas is actually doing everything in order to involve and to put inside the uh, conflict with Israel civilian on the Palestinian side, playing with their lives, playing with the uh, civil facilities, playing with ambulances like it was the case uh, two days ago. And all together, we are facing, if I would say, a war within the war. I would say a war of communication within the war against Hamas, against terrorist organizations like Hamas is. Olivier, one of the things you mentioned there is Hamas's use of human shields in this conflict. We've seen more and more evidence every single day showing just how extensive this use is. Has this changed Israel's operational policy on the ground? Because right now the world is putting more and more pressure on Israel every single day. What sort of considerations has this brought in? For example, a few minutes ago, the IDF released information concerning missiles fired from a, a pool uh, for use for kids in, in Gaza, or like a kindergarten, like okay, you see now the pictures uh, of what we have found uh, today uh, in Gaza. So they are using everything in order to 
to involve uh, to involve a civilian. But the the world, the public opinion, is not really convinced, and uh, we have to convince them to show them. And even when we show them, they don't want to believe it. So it's a real war of influence, of information, of of, of trying to convince them. But I would say uh, I would like to say something. No, when we share information with allies, with intelligence agencies, and uh, they see the truth, they know everything, but they, it's difficult for the public opinion, mostly in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, to accept that Israel as a state is facing an existential threat like Hamas. It is like Daesh for Europe, for America a few years ago. And if we don't uh, destroy Hamas, it will be a threat not only for Israel, but for all the area, maybe for all the world. So there is a kind of, of hypocrisy, hypocrisy meaning like we, we show that we are doing something for the world. We are trying the best in order to prevent civilians to be uh, involved in the conflict. But the public opinion in the world refuse to see the truth. It's a war within the war. We have to win the war against Hamas and I hope that we also will win the war of information to make world understand that we are doing what we have to do with the most ethical and most moral way to do it.